Good morning and welcome back to day two of the ULI Asia Pacific Summit. My name is Brandon Sedloff and I'm the managing director for ULI Asia Pacific. When we embarked on planning this summit last year, we had no idea about the expectations or what success looked like. It was the first time that we had planned the ULI Asia Pacific Summit here in the region. We define success by simply bringing together a few of our members to talk about some of the issues that were shaping the cities that we live in and the markets that we work in here in the region. Needless to say, over 250 of you, our members, came out and delivered, and we had set a bar pretty high. When we start planning these events each year, one of the things that we do to get started is we assemble a group of members, which we call the program committee. One of the primary roles of the program committee is to identify speakers for the summit. And naturally, the way that things start is we start listing our top choices for best speakers or the most relevant speakers for us. And the list is usually fairly succinct. And when we set out, we hope that we can find one of them and encourage them to come. Hopefully it's a friend of ULI. Two, even better. Three, highly unlikely. Four, five, six, seven, improbable. Well, I'm glad to say that we've done the impossible today. Um, over the past two days, we've assembled a group of the most visionary real estate leaders that the region and the world has to offer. Um, and I think that you'll agree that the, the program yesterday and the program that we have lined up for you for the best of today is truly impressive. Before I get started and introduce our opening keynotes, I want to briefly reflect on ULI's growing membership in the region. Yesterday, John Fitzgerald touched upon the 1,200 member milestone. So we recently broke through 1,000 members in the region. Now we have 1,200 members across the region. To put things in perspective, membership growth year over year is 40%. We all know who run businesses, sure. Um, percentage growth is always high off the low base, but hey, 40% is a pretty good number. So thank you all very much for helping to contribute to that. Everybody in this room is now a ULI member. As a not-for-profit organization, one of the things that keeps us going and keeps me going is the support that we get from each of you. When I go around the region meeting with you, talking to your companies, for those of you that know me, I'm usually asking for something. I feel like a traveling salesman with my hands out. I'm always begging. I'm asking for time. I'm asking for money. I'm asking for something, your commitment. The thing that makes this job so fulfilling to me is that you all deliver. Every single one of you delivers. And that is a testament to the strength of the ULI network and the organization that we're all a part of. So thank you very much on behalf of the Urban Land Institute for everything that you do for us. I would like to use this opportunity again to thank our sponsors. Um, please see the board, it is an amazing group. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank our platinum, gold, and silver sponsors of the second annual ULI Asia Pacific, Shoyan Land, the Far East Organization, Chong Bang Group, Hong Kong Land, AECOM, Tishman Spire, and the Executive Center. I'd also like to briefly thank those of you in the room who are inaugural members of the new ULI Corporate Sustaining Membership. This is a new membership category for us at ULI, and we are very pleased to see the interest and uptake on our new corporate sustaining program in the region, and I hope to build on this exemplary list of real estate companies and the people that drive them in years to come. A few housekeeping notes before we get started, and I promise not to read through all these pages. Um, please switch off your mobile phones. If you have to take a call, please step outside. There is SI equipment, simultaneous interpretation. Um, so for the first session, you won't need it. Uh, well, the first session will be conducted, I should say, in English. So if you need it, um, please please step outside uh, and pick that up before we get started. And lastly, um, please wear your name badges at all times so we can recognize you. So here we are. We're very excited. I'm very excited about our opening keynote speakers this morning. And I say speakers because there's two of them. Each of these gentlemen really need no introduction. They're luminaries and they're visionaries. And they literally are creating and changing the way that we live, work, and play 
through the real estate decisions that they're making here in Asia and around the world. Yesterday morning I had the opportunity at breakfast with both of these distinguished gentlemen, and I know that their insights and perspectives, which they're going to share with us this morning, will not disappoint you. And for the record, although it was unplanned, Both of these gentlemen confirmed their ability to participate in the ULI Summit and both told us that they had one slot available to speak. Both it was on June 6th in the morning and it just so happens that they've also recently completed a joint venture together in the United States, so now they're partners. So the fortuitous events are all unfolding. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce um, our opening, our, our first speaker, Chairman Wong Shu, who's the founder of China Banke. Since Mr. Wong founded and led Wonke in 1994, he has profoundly shaped Wonke's corporate visions, ethics, and management strategies. Under his leadership, Wonke has grown into the world's largest residential home developer by sales revenue and China's pioneer in green home construction. Just quickly repeat that. Wonke has grown into the world's largest residential home developer and a pioneer great and sustainable development. Two extremely critical points. There's a lot to say about Chairman Wong, um, but I will let him speak for himself. But one thing that I'd like to share with all of you that you may not know is Chairman Wong is a passionate mountaineer, and he's reached the peak of Everest from the north and south faces in 2003 and 2010, respectively. And he's the 11th person in the world to accomplish the 7 plus 2 which is reaching the seven summits in 2004 and the North and South Poles in 2005. With a global vision of environmental sustainability inspired by his adventures, and he informed me over breakfast the next major adventure will be an around the world sailing trip. Around the world sailing trip. Um, Mr. Wong sits on the board of the World Wildlife Fund and the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on Governance for Sustainability with a particular focus on forest, biodiversity, and climate change. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Huang Shu. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as, the, as the host introduced uh, me, I'm the mountain twice, as the Everest twice. For me, I prepare to climb the Everest mountain at the um, third, third time. And then I, <laughs> yeah, I, I will be the 30 years old. But two years uh, ago, I designed and I stopped that. Uh, that progress because uh, two years ago I was uh, reading at uh, Harvard. Then I was there, I failed, and uh, much difficult than climb <laughs> out the Everest. So I gave up. So I think that uh, climbing the Norway mountain is uh, uh, much difficult than climbing the Jesus mountain. So, I think uh, in the morning, uh, as a speaker, maybe as a journalist, that's the uh, I'm afraid, right? So, um, I try to do it in the Chinese. I'm now in New York, or in the New York city. 遇到很多生意场的人第一次见面的时候 
我清楚。但是对于中国方面来讲，这个泡沫呢，结构上和中国的发展商和这种观点呢，是有两种观点，一种观点是有，一种观点是没有。呃，我是属于呢是有泡沫派，所以在。在中国呢，应该说是关于有泡沫派呢，是不大受欢迎的。第二个呢，尤其是作为一个房地产商，是吧？你在谈中国的房地产有泡沫呢，那就更不受欢迎。那作为一个有影响力的、有一定知名度的房地产发展商的董事长呢，讲中国有泡沫呢。那显然是让人家不但不受欢迎，而且是不大理解。说你是个房地产发展商，你在谈有泡沫，而且泡沫还非常危险。那你的公司的政策是什么呢？是不是因为中国的房地产有泡沫，你跑到美国去投资了？嗯，是不是因为中国的房地产有泡沫，你和提示们合作？在国外投资，我就很想就这些问题呢，就借着我们呃优良来亚太地区的年会呢这个机会，谈谈我的一些观点。<笑>那我们看到了《六十分钟》杂志来讲呢，以中国有泡沫呢，他用典型的说故事的方法来说。中国的现在存存在的鬼城现象，实际这个鬼城的并不是《六十分钟》杂志的发明，在两三年之前，中央电视台，也就是中国最大的主流媒体，在谈到中国的房地产问题、中国房地产的产生的泡沫现象的时候，曾经非常重点报道过。呃，这是。呃，六十分钟杂志呢是在用的，我是接下来的图片，像类似这样的可能还有不少的这样的所谓的鬼城，但是我想又给出这样一个图片，我们这个图片呢，你们发现这就是中国在现在目前大城市在斗楼市的现在。一种现象。那中国这楼市好的时候呢，这些楼市好到什么程度呢？是有几种说法的。一种呢，叫做月光台，叫叫 moon city， 月光台。但是呢，它什么叫月光盘呢？就是 empty of the moon city。这个意思什么意思呢？解释中国话来讲，就是一个月就销售完了。当然，我们美国的同行就很激动啊，你这个项目一个月就卖完了。那我们这儿还有呢 ，empty of a week， 什么意思呢？就是一个礼拜就卖光了，叫叫这个。星期光盘啊，就一个礼拜卖光了。当然，还有一种呢，就是 empty of a day。这个呢，对我们这个东方厅来讲就一万多，叫日光盘。什么意思呢？叫一天，叫日光盘。当然，呃，随着这几年我们调控，日光盘是越来越少了。那我们看到，就这样一张图片呢，是两千一零年，是万科在北京的一个销售楼盘，这个地方呢叫做长阳半岛，啊，离北京非常远，它在北京在至少是六十公里的位置上，这在一零年的时候，我们叫中央调控，这很严厉的时候，这个呢基本上是一一天呢卖出去。六十。那三年过去了，同样还是这个地区的万科的楼盘
这个卖的一天还是一天开盘就卖百分之六十。那我们这里呢，就给出了说中国的同时的两种现象存在，一种呢，就是《六十分钟》杂志报道上的，就是北城，有大量的工厂；另一方面呢，这是同时呢。还是一个项目，六百套、一千套、两千套，开盘的当天就可以卖百分之六十。就这种现象，怎么来解释这两种现象？那我想这里给我们有 I I 会员的一个观点，就是中国现在市场是非常非常大，从计划经济。向市场经济过渡当中开放呢，已经过了三十六年。如果我们还按照中国传统的计划经济的铁板一块的，我一个整体的判断，那它一定会有很大的失误。我们对中国看中国，就要像看美国一样这样去看，就比较合适。比如说，我谈到美国，就会谈到中国。西部、中部，即使是东部、西部，不同的城市、不同的州，可能反映的方面的情况都不一样。比如说，零八年金融危机之后，我们所知道，我在在波士顿和纽约，基本上房地产价格没有受到影响，基本上没有受到影响。那我们看到很多城市呢。受的冲击非常非常大，直到现在就还没有恢复过来。那我们所在的看西部的旧金山、洛杉矶，是吧？纽约、波士顿很明显，到现在价格已经在开始回升，需求非常明显的表现出来了，强烈的需求。这个我们看中国也是一一样。如果我们谈到中国，就是说它房地产有没有泡沫？房地产？是不是到了破了边缘？这个也都会是一种误导。所以我也想说这个问题：中国目前到底是一种什么一种情况？我们看到，我们给了下面那张图表，要显示的呢是不同的城市它的售价的。就是和收入的是一个什么关系？我们发现呢，这个差异是非常非常大的。比如说，我们显示到北京、上海、深圳、大连这样的城市呢，我们发现呢，就是你买一套房子和你工资的收入呢，已经之间差距呢，差距到是二十倍以上。我们在国际上呢，我们在学术上有一种说，什么样的价格才合理？说买套房子，你多少年的收入啊是可以来来进行偿还。那显然一般来讲，国际上有不同的这个给的比例，有的说是五年，有的说是六年，有的说八年。但无论如何，都超过十年的很少。那我们看到了，中国的会发现。你超过二十倍以上的这样的，包括我们开会所在的上海，那这里就有这样一个问题了，就是你这一套是多大面积？就我这里给的呢是九平方米，九平方米。但是你会发现，如果你给一百五十平方米，比如说按照说美国人的居住习惯。按照欧洲人的这种习惯，呃，至少得一百五十平方米。显然，按照这个方法来说，这个可能就是在达到了四十。那我们给了九十平方米一套呢？我想这是个两个概念。所以两个概念就比东京、香港、新加坡。所以我记得在两年前呢，有一篇文章谈到，就是中国的。目前城市居民准备做多大一套合适的时候呢？我是遭到了网上八零后、九零零、九零后的一致的谴责和怒骂。我大概说的意思来讲，比较
，工业面的平均功耗，三个人的平均功耗，实际上基本一套的面积的平均功耗是在一百平方米以下的。所以我说，为什么中国人一定要住一百平方米以上呢？大概我想说的就是，这是亚洲模型。亚洲城市模型是什么呢？就是人多地少，人多地少，呃、只有往高上走，啊，节制交通。啊，人多地少，而且这个土地的价格就很贵。这个往高上涨，它成本非常高。啊，土地又昂贵，所以这个不能这么大。所以我们来讲，给出九十平方米呢，是这样一个比例收入。那反过来讲，我们再说，如果给六十平方米收一套呢，五十平方米一套呢，可能会得出这个结论又不大了。所以我们看到，在中国的城市。这种收入、家庭收入和这个住房的这个还款的能力上来讲，应该说目前我想说的两个特点，一个两个特点。如果你还想住很大的房子，这套房子按照收入的能力来讲，那是不算成本，就是这个显得价格偏高。但如果你按照亚洲的模型，按照东京的经验、香港的经验、新加坡的经验。目前在中国，应该说对于收入比来讲，这样一个比例还尚在可承受之中，这是我想说的。再一个，你会发现，在中国的城市，很多城市还低于二十倍，甚至低于十倍。那这应该是对中国的一个情况的基本判断。所以，对于六十分钟得出结论的感觉来说，中国的房地产这个泡沫，这个就泡裂，这个就承受不住。这个观念不是泡沫，我的观点是不是个泡沫？如果持续下去，是有危险性，但是对中国的市场不能一概而论，这是我想说的。第一个观点，当然，如果不能控制住，泡沫破裂了，那将是相当糟糕的，这是毫无观点。那下面我想说第二个问题，就是说，怎么来判断中国的这样的一个局面？把上海。北京和这样的到底能支撑多久？是不是还要继续上涨呢？还是马上就要下跌呢？我想回答这个问题。那我们再看这样的这个数字，这个数字，呃，我想说的呢就是。这是中国一种非常特别的现象，就是为什么上海、北京这样的一个城市，是、啊、这样的房价这么高，购买力还这么强？实际上，这是中国的，我想第一个，首先一个，就是一个城市有没有购买力，有没有发展前途。显然和它的人口增长还是很有关系的，是吧？比如说我在哈佛上一课呢，就评价美国的城市的时候，就是有有两个城市呢一直在持续增长，很多就是它的人口数，啊，比如说你们，比如说波士顿，非常有希望的，说城市增长了，美国还在增长，这人还是有吸引力。实际上我们能看到了，我们给这张图表来讲呢，就是我们出现的这种像北京、上海。现在，尽管现在也是两千万以上人口的大城市了，但每年还是至少五十万以上的人口机械的往这城市移动。这一个，在这里，在我们来看到来讲，中国的城市并不是都在增长。尽管现在的城市化过程当中，我们发现一些城市人口在减少，啊，它不是一个中国的城市化过程都在增长，像北京、上海每年至少在。五十万以上，你像深圳这样，已经增加到的是一千四百万人口了。应该说，要我个人的观点来讲，深圳的人口应该是增长放缓了。比如说，原来很多的来这加工工厂都搬走了，说他为什么深圳人口还在增长？你会发现，原来在这打工的，只是在这打工，到春节的时候，到过年的时候，他们就回到家乡去了。但经过在深圳的七八年、十几年打工，现在不仅仅他们住在这里，开始
开始把他们的家里人、父母啊，看看，就这个人口呢还在增长。显然，这个城市人口在增长，而且经济它就持续下去。那这是我们如果外国投资者啊，美国的投资者到中国来投资的时候，看有没有希望实现和对美国的城市判断，就是一样。你看这个城市人口，现在持续增长。还是停滞，还是在减少？来判断你是否在这个投资。那第二个这个因素呢，这就是中国的一个特殊的情况。我们发现，发现就是在中国，我们知道这个城市发展，仅仅人口增长还是不够的。还是需要其他的一些公共设施，比如说医疗，比如说教育。像为什么北京、上海啊这两个城市，它整个的人口占基数会占百分之一？但是我们会发现，它的整个的教育重点学校的教育资源占了百分之三十。也就是最优秀的国家重点扶持，我们说中国的教育系统还是以国有为主，重点扶持的二百多所重点院校，百分之三十是集中在这里。最好的医疗，对医院、医生是集中在这两个城市。这是为什么？啊，这两个城市始终啊多昂贵。啊，我也往里挤。那这是中国一个非常特殊的情况。说基于这样一个基本判断，目前现在这样的北京的房价、上海的房价是不可能下来的。而且在目前的一个水平上说，它泡沫化、泡裂了，就我个人看，不是不行，因为它有需求的这样旺盛的支撑。现在的问题是，不是如何让它跌下来？是如何让它如何涨得慢？如何涨得过快？那这个前提没有问题。显然，从这个角度来看，我认为中国连续这几年的中央宏观调控政策、中央和地方配合宏观调控是成功的。也就是在过去的三到四年之内，啊，整个包括上海、北京在内，房价价格的上涨的速度是低于净利收入的百分之四。所以，如果宏观调控好了，啊，这个软着陆是很难的。所以，我们一些国外的大投资者在上海、北京选择的一些综合投资项目，我们知道这个投就得七年八年，要使用就得考虑到三十年、五十年甚至一百年，说不用紧张，不用紧张。啊，不要就说它的泡沫，我就，呃，我这个投资前景会怎么样？应该是没有问题，没有问题。这是中国的国情所决定的。当然，这个我看到有一个因素啊，决定的，那就是空气污染。啊，这一点，就北京还是相当、相当不利。啊，这个可能这是带来一个不确定因素。但是在中央，在中国的情况来看，你会发现，有一些情况如果不走到极端，不走到条件环境很恶化，还不当回事儿，好在出了很严重的问题，是北京。什么意思呢？因为出的问题是北京，如果你不改，即使你监督，我们很多外国大使馆的那些国外工作人员不喜欢他们。他们就不愿意在北京啊继续办事，可能影响就国际问题。所以可能面临的选择来讲，要不咱们就啊这个环境改善，啊，要不来讲就是我们是不是换个地方去生活？显然呢，根据中国的情况，据我所知道，我当时的反应来讲，啊，北京出现这种严重问题的时候。我的感觉来讲，我计在三年不能超过四年的。
三年四年之内，北京的空气质量一定会大大改善。这是我得出的结论。还有不是说悲观的说，好了，证明北京的重要性。刚才说了，我们各种资源的集中和北京的经济条件一定会改善。好，这是。是另外一个话题了。那我们再看看，除了刚才说整个考虑这个这个教育资源、医疗资源、整个的基础设施集中在这中心城市来讲呢，这种情况在中西部都更明显。如果你们有做一个调查的话，你们会发现很有意思的现象，就是一个城市的整个经济资源。百分之五十，甚至更多，百分之六十，集中在省会城市。那么我们就说，全国性来讲，像上海、北京，但是如果你到各省去，尤其到中西部，你会发现，它的资源主要集中在省会。所以，如果到中西部投资去，我觉得你唯一选择的就是。如果你到下面去投资，我就说那你要小心。这是我想说的，就是中国的这样一个非常特殊的情况。那我们再看看，目前销售情况的趋势来讲，显然在中国来讲，中国来讲就是小情况。放车为什么说市场一直把握的比较好？为什么就是不能调控？不调控。把放歌的卖的上都非常好，甚至可以来讲，越调控，放歌的房东卖的越好。第一，是它市场在那里；第二，你如何做，我们就怎么做，刚性需求。实际上，放歌呢做的户型已经我们做的最小的，已经到了十四平方米，十四平方米。当然，这不是主流户型，主流户型还是在六十平方米。哦，啊，就刚性需而且更有意思的是，中国目前排到前五位的大的房地产公司，现在都在住户的小区房，也就最适合中国的一个国情发展。那第二个来讲呢，我想在这里呢就说一下，中国目前的房地产市场，应该说还没有。划清楚来讲，就是如何的商品房市场和另外的一个包装房市场，这方面已经中国已经做了很多改善，但是如何来政策上更明晰，让更多的中低收入、让低收入家庭来进行住这个居屋，这个还有相当相当一段路要走。所以这个问题如果解决不了，更多的吧，这个。消费者没有能力购买的消费者呢，也集中在这商品房市场，这个问题就是非常大。那第三个，我想说的就是，住房和其他任何市场是一样，正在进行这一个转型期。仅仅住宅小型化，这是一方面。如何来讲，就是中国转型当中，保证如何从粗放。如何来讲旺水能源到精细进行一个发展，进行小型化是不够。如何绿色建筑？如何注意环保？如何关心环保？比如像我们甘心讲到北京的情况，说我们相信这个空气会改善的。那会改善和我们是什么关系呢？和我们关系两点关系和我们正常。第一，啊，你不仅仅要做有效率的、小型的、适合中国城市发展的住房。第二。建设过程当中，如何不要产生更多的建筑垃圾？建筑过程当中，如何更多的建筑的这种节能环保的状态？在这方面，就不仅仅是一个发展商问题，就牵扯到城市的规划、土地政策，如何一系列的法规。所以，我个人觉得 ，U L I 和亚太。这样的高峰会在上海召开，我个人觉得是有相当意义的。也就是中国在如何城市化的过程当中，我们如何在
是吧？在成长过程，几乎我们生活水平的同时，我们要如何来讲，关心我们的环境，对我们的环保。显然，这方面，中国的从城市规划、发展各方面，是从发展上的水平认识是远远不够。但恰好在这个时候，中国在成长，意识到我们需要这个，显然像。U L I 这样的综合各种规划师、设计师、有关政府的政策制定者和各方面的如何跨行业的和跨部门的之间的这样的交流融合推进，在中国是非常非常希望。所以我也希望，呃，这次上海的会议呢是一个转机，不仅仅是在这一次峰会，我也希望我们。U L A 的 U L I 的，我们这个组织能更早的在中国落地。所以我听说，是吧？这个落地选择的第一呢是在上海，我觉得地点选择非常好。应该如何在中国从传统社会向现代社会过程当中呢？上海本身就是城市化过程当中的一个最前面的城市，而且在整个城市的综合管理往前走来讲。上海是走在最前面的，那我衷心希望我们 U L I 的这个在中国开展业务能尽早开展。作为万科，作为个人报名，作为 U L I 在中国设立我们组织部门的第一批会员，谢谢各位。Chairman, especially for your candor. Now, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our next opening keynote speaker, Mr. Rob Spire. Rob was named co-chief executive, co-chief executive at Tishman Spire in 2008, and he continues to serve as its president. Mr. Spire also serves as the chairman of the Real Estate Board of New York, New York City's premier industry association. With more than 13,000 members, in 2006, Rob was appointed by New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg to be the chair of the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City, the city's not-for-profit corporation. Mr. Spire is the founder and co-chair of the Committee to Save New York, a coalition of business, labor, and civic groups promoting fiscal reform for the state of New York, and he is the co-chair. Of the construction committee of St. Patrick's Cathedral Landmark Foundation, which oversees the renovation of the country's most renowned cathedral, Rob is extremely active in the formation of smart and livable cities, including cities across the United States, Brazil, Europe, and here in China. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Rob Spire to the stage. Thank you, and uh, Rongsha, it is an honor to share this stage with you. You know what a great admirer I am of yours. You are truly one of the visionaries in this global industry of ours. I also want to thank ULI, and particularly commend them on their aggressive push into China. You simply can't be an organization in the 21st century and not make your China strategy an imperative. ULI has played a critical role in our industry the last 80 years, and its China push will secure that role for the next 80 years. And I would say, as a goal today, we have 500 people at the conference. Let's double that next year. Conferences serve a selfish purpose for all of us. We get to network, sometimes get to source transactions. But I think there's a higher purpose as well. It gives people from different cultures a chance to communicate, a chance to vitiate the kind of misunderstandings that Chairman Wong spoke about. 
And I think that the more we collaborate as business people, the more we set the stage for better global communication across the board. We're all aware that there is an extremely significant meeting happening this week that isn't the ULI China meeting, but is happening in Southern California between President Obama and President Xi Jinping. There are high hopes for this summit meeting, and there should be high hopes, because it is critical that our two countries put our relationship on a sustainable and productive footing for the 21st century. The world will be watching our presidents, and the world will be watching our two countries, and will be looking to us for leadership. There's no better example of the fruits of that kind of joint effort than recent events on the Korean Peninsula. Working quietly but earnestly together, the U.S. and China helped avoid what could have been an international crisis. We need more of that kind of cooperation. I'm struck by how often I'm asked by people, hey, isn't it a bad thing that the Chinese are investing so much capital into the United States? I would sort of not take that seriously as a question if I weren't asked it so often. The fact of the matter is that cross-border investment plays an absolutely imperative role in our global economy. And we in the U.S. ought to know that better than anyone. Let's remember the days of 2009, those dark days, especially for commercial real estate. Many U.S. investors thought it would be years before we saw a recovery. It was capital from East Asia, it was capital from the Middle East, it was capital from Europe and other regions of the world that helped secure commercial real estate values in that time of need. And it would be unfortunate and moreover foolish to forget those lessons now that we're in the midst of a recovery. I would say it very simply. A strong U.S. economy is good for China, and a strong Chinese economy is good for the U.S. Tishman Spire and Wang Ke have had the opportunity to foster our own little collaboration on a joint venture we've established to develop a project in San Francisco. Now, this will be the largest residential project in the history of San Francisco with 700 units. Now I know by a Chinese measuring stick that sounds very small, but for anybody who is familiar with the entitlement process in San Francisco, it's actually an extraordinarily large project. Chairman Wong has been his usual humble and gracious self in describing Wonka's investment as an educational experience and an opportunity to learn about development in the United States. The truth is that we at Tishman Spire have learned a great deal from our relationship with Wang Ke and watching how they do business very carefully here in China. I'll offer a, a few examples of this. They have a new line of business in developing prefabricated housing. Now the advantages of this from a cost and a timing standpoint are obvious. But there's one other critical benefit, and that is it provides much less wear and tear on the environment by doing as much of the construction off-site in a factory rather than doing it on-site. And I think prefabricated housing with Wonka in the leadership position is going to become a much more important trend, not just here in China, but in other countries as well. I've also watched with amazement Wonka's procurement machine. It is as efficient and aggressive as the procurement department at any Fortune 100 manufacturing company. But the thing that is remarkable is that they are able to drive procurement 
without sacrificing anything on a quality level. You go into a Wongo project, you know from how it's built and how it's run that it's their brand. Finally, and then I'll stop the Wongo commercial, but I really am a huge believer and supporter of their business. I had the opportunity a couple of years ago, after Chairman Wong and I first met, to visit their headquarters in Shenzhen. Wonka is obviously best known as a residential company, the largest residential development company in the world. But what you may not know is that their office building in Shenzhen is one of the most remarkable, sustainable, and I think architecturally significant office buildings that I've seen, and I have visited a lot of cities and a lot of markets. So I, I think it is just another testament to how well run that company is. The relationship with Wonka has been but one of the benefits of establishing our business in China. We set up shop here in 2006, and we arrived with some competitive advantages that we sought to take to capitalize on. We have been a global company now for nearly 30 years, a pioneer in the globalization of the real estate industry, and we have had a very strong focus on sustainable design and construction, and we think that that's something you do not only in your home country, but you do everywhere where you have a business. And finally, we have very strong relationships with the Fortune 500 companies. And as they expand their real estate footprint and enter new markets, they look to us as one of their first calls when they're seeking guidance, counsel, and ultimately a landlord. So we arrived with those advantages, but we also arrived with a strong dose of humility. Because our company's global expansion efforts had been informed by a pretty simple philosophy. You go global by going local. You go global by going local. What does that mean? In China, we have 200 employees, and all but two of them are from East Asia. And that is very typical of the way that we staff our businesses around the world. Brazil, India, Europe, U.S. function in the same manner. Now to ensure that we maintain that very high quality of talent, not just for this cycle, but for the next cycle and the cycle after that, we have recently set up a unique partnership with Fudan University. We are taking a dozen of their students each year. We're putting them, them through a bespoke training program. And then we hope that some of them will become future leaders of our business here in China and potentially future leaders of our business overseas. I think the best example of how this emphasis on talent has led to good things for us in China is just a few kilometers from here in the Yangu Desert. We are developing one of the largest mixed-use projects ever done in Shanghai. It will be, when complete, nearly 10 million square feet, and half of that is currently under construction. Our anchor tenant in that project is Nike. They will move their greater China headquarters to our facility and take up to a million square feet. Now Nike could have chosen any piece of land and any developer in Shanghai. They chose us for some very specific reasons. We had a relationship with them dating back to the 1990s in New York. They knew they could trust us. They have a very strong corporate emphasis on sustainability, just like us and the building will be lead gold, just as our new building in Chengdu is lead gold, just as our projects across China will be lead gold, or better. And finally, Nike wanted to make sure that we had the same commitment to innovation that they did. 
to prove that, we agreed to something unprecedented in our company's more than 100 year development track record. In the lobby of Nike's building will be a full length basketball court. Very unusual, but something that will become undoubtedly a signature and an icon for them in China. We now have 20 million feet under development through the country with offices in Chengdu, Suzhou, Tianjin, Beijing, and of course here. And we look forward to greater expansion. But maybe the biggest surprise and ultimately the greatest long-term driver for us in China is the reciprocal value that our China business is creating for other businesses for us around the world. Let me offer a couple of examples. In Rio de Janeiro, where we've had a business for nearly 20 years, we had an office project under development and we're about to begin our leasing program. When we received a call from China State Grid, they had recently expanded their business to Brazil and were looking for a building of high quality and stature to make their own. We sold them the building, they retained us to manage the building, and China State Grid has become a very important global client now to Tishman Spire. At Rockefeller Center in New York, which is our flagship property, we have in addition to NBC and Lazar Frere, CCTV, and China Eastern Airlines. And we look forward to welcoming Chinese companies in our properties worldwide. Last year, we closed the first R&D fund by a non-Chinese developer. It was a small fund, but a huge milestone for us. The investors include large institutions and high net worth individuals. And I believe that B will not only be a critical source of capital for us here in China, but it will be a critical source of capital for us globally. And this first fund sets the foundation for the growth of our capital markets business here in China. Finally, of course, we have our relationship with Wang Ke. And it's a great example of what two companies can do when they provide for common collaboration. They're not looking to get an edge on each other, but they're looking to achieve common goals. It's this kind of business collaboration that we need more of, just like we need it politically. And I think if this conference is a harbinger of what's going to happen in Southern California on Friday and Saturday, that would be great, not just for the U.S. and for China, but for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'd like to now welcome back to the stage Chairman, Chairman Wong, please and introduce my colleague, John, John Fitzgerald. John is the Senior Vice President and Executive Director of ULI Asia Pacific. We're now gonna spend the next few minutes with a moderated panel discussion, which John will lead between Chairman Wong and Rob. Well, you've both given us quite a bit to think about and talk about, and of course, we have some time. What really strikes me, uh, what I listen to both of you and somebody who's been out here in Asia for six years now, is that real estate is it's a, real, it's a localized business. And yet both of you uh, in your firms are invested outside of your home markets. Um, why is that? Why take the risk? And what's the long-term strategy? And uh, Chairman Wong, uh, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, 
世界最大的一个房地产市场。呃，从城市化过程当中呢，就是全反对有的这样的城市化过程。但是你像这种城市化的速度呢，它一定还有有放缓的一天，甚至有停滞的一天。那从一个高速经济增长、城市化迅速过程当中，到成熟市场。它一定有这样的转变，显然呢，万科到国外，主要是到工业发达国家去投资，非常清楚，是去学习，是为中国城市将军转型呢做准备。因为万科在中国呢做房地产市场建设，我们把我们确定为领跑者。那领跑者呢，就是要解决未来遇到的问题。一个成熟的城市。应该是怎么发展？咱们应该怎么发展？应该扮演的角色，这是我们到美国去投资，是第一个考虑，就是为未来做准备。实际上，中国一些城市已经在转型，说比如说上海，比如说深圳，啊，都在进行这样的一个从高速的经济增长，向一个比较成成熟的城市发展道路。显然，这美国的这些城市是怎么走过来的？他们遇到哪些问题，怎么解决的，去学习，这是第一。那第二点呢，就是要进行投资的一个平衡。像万科目前来讲，应该说，呃，百分之九十八的投资是在中国市场上。如果从一个投资的平衡上，就是万科考虑呢，要平衡百分之二十的投资业务到国际上投资。那第三个呢，就更简单一些。就是跟着呃我们的消费者走。现在呢，美国市场已经成为中国的移民的主要的移民市场，所以那我们的客户移民到美国去了，我们就跟着客户到那里，主要注意一下。但是呃，我是 real estate isn't just a local business. We think of it as a quintessential local business. Because every city you go to in any country, you see a similar dynamic, which are markets dominated not by large companies like ours, but by local entrepreneurs who do nothing but own and develop in that particular market. Now that's led to some interesting consequences. The most important of which is that there is a dramatic discrepancy in the quality of buildings between cities and countries. My favorite example is in Brazil, again, a country where we've been developing for nearly 20 years. Still, at this point, half of the buildings in Sao Paulo and Rio don't have air conditioning. Half of them. Now, I know Americans are a little obsessed with air conditioning, and you know, you have to account for that. But the fact of the matter is, multinational companies, whether they're expanding in Brazil, or they're expanding in China, or any other country, they want the kind of quality space for their employees that they have in their headquarters. And so for us, like what Wangsha said, we're following our customer base. Our principal customer base are large multinational companies. And where they are expanding, we are expanding. Oh, the question of the financial is the economic issue. I have said it before. I also agree. The financial issue is very strong. But how to invest in the economy? For example, in Hong Kong, we have many foreign investors. We have learned. 学习了如何外国投资者在中国投房地产的这样的经验，比如说，我们和一家有影响力的跨国的投资房地产公司呢，合作了十八个项目在中国，我们成立了董事会，但是我们发现，这家公司除了在董事会有成员参加董事会以外，整个合资公司的具体操作没有派一个人，就是完全依靠马克的团队。这么多年，我们投资了十八个项目，他们没派一个人
，财务总监呢，什么外房经理啊，都没有。那我才发现，就是这样一个地方性很强的公司业务呢，你最好的办法，你就是说选择你相信的公司，委托这家公司去做。所以我们虽然到国外、到美国是第一次投资，我们采取了同样的策略，选择当地很有名的品牌和这家公司合作。我们也学习，我们不怕一个人。这样的结果呢，实际上省了很多事儿，而且我们也知道，你选择这个品牌，它已经替你背书了，就相当于到中国选择中国的一家企业，这家企业也替他这家公司背书的是一样。所以根据这个经验，我们会加快在美国。顺便讲一下，我们第一次在美国投资的，我的个人感觉，由于在中国这个新兴经济体发展当中，它有很多中国人东方的文化的形式，很多是不大透明的，法律上是不大清楚的，很多交易当中是模糊的。万科在这里市场当中，我们经营了三十年，我们已经。习惯了这种这种被折磨，我们习惯了这种什么事情很不容易，突然到了美国投资，我有点不太相信，就这么容易就可以决定了，就这么容易就好呵呵就可以投资了，所以我们发现，在虽然美国的市场没有中国这么蓬勃，这么兴旺。但是，在一个成熟、透明的一个市场投资，效果是非常高的，是我想说的。我不知道，都不知道，都不知道怎么说的。啊，你有为什么他要做这些事情？因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，因为，Yeah, it's a nice story, and again, confers how important conferences like this are. There was a conference by a different organization, a China-based organization, in New York a couple of years ago. And Wang Xia and a couple of other executives came to our office for breakfast. And the two of us just, just played. We may not speak the same first language, but we clearly had very aligned views on real estate and on partnership. So by the end of the breakfast, we exchanged cards and developed a friendship. And have had several meetings since, and then ultimately we were able to create a transaction together. But as is always the case, the partnership and the relationship is much more important and singular than the transaction. Even a transaction as large as what we'll be developing together San Francisco. Well, I mean, building on that, Rob, we'll be in discussing this a bit, and Chairman Wong will touch on this a bit as well. But so, as a, as a U.S.-based company, and you and I, obviously, as a U.S. originated organization, and a lot of our members, we see we're starting to see the increased inflows of capital and partnerships coming from China. How is that impacting your business? How do you think it's going to impact the, the industry itself? And uh, do you think it's, it, is it good? Is it bad? What is your perspective? Cross-border investment is critical to the real estate industry as it's becoming more critical to every industry and asset class. We at Tishman Inspire have tried our best to capitalize on that. Over 75% of our investors are non-US despite the fact that we have been a U.S. headquartered company since 1897. And my guess is that the proportion of non-U.S. capital will only grow over time. And General what, what do you see as an organization like ULI? What, what's our role to facilitate these relationships between Chinese firms such as yourself and you have a role in the firm, such as this one's life. 
现在中国呃改革开放呢，到现在应该说由于它的巨大的市场，所以需要在中国呢，你在过去的这几十年当中，既是给福放，让你抓住机会呢，赚钱也是比较容易的。呃，在中国转型当中，你会发现。如何适应这个转型？如何提高效率？显然呢，中国的企业呢，如何来按照国际上的操作的这样的一种方式呢，还有相当的差距。举例来讲，如何行业上的互相的信息共享、互相交流、互相支援这种形式来讲呢，在中国还不大适应。比如说，中国也有一些行业。对，但这种行业协会呢有两类，一类呢是半官方的，就是靠有关主管部门牵头成立这样的协会。相对来讲，这种协会呢就是缺少活力，这是相对而言，缺少活力，呃，交流、互相促进的作用非常非常有限，甚至说是只是到年底开一次会。聚一次餐，请演一场节目，哎、呃，平时可能组织一次欧洲游、美国游，仅此。那、呃、另外一种，就是民间真正的按照行业情趣追求，呃，理想在一块儿的组织，这样在中国也开始成长起来。他们确实起到一个信息共享、互相支援，甚至在一个政策的。制定上来进行力度来影响，但是像 U L I 这样的，就是它是跨行业，它是和城市发展有关系的，不同的建筑师、设计师、规划师、发展商，说大的制造业、各种行业和城市发展有关系的综合性的这样的协会，应该说在中国。基本上，对和城市发展有关系的这样的没有。你比如说，这里有什么呢？有市场协会，啊，就是市场之间交流，城市怎么发展，这是决策者之间的交流。有建筑师协会，有发展商协会，有建筑材料和后面装饰材料协会，有各种这样非常单一的协会，而这种协会和协会之间呢，是很少。所以说，中国现在发展当中，城市需要综合性，需要不同的主管部门、规划部门、发展商、设计部门、生产材料供应商互相这样的一个联系。我觉得，在中国发展当中，恰好非常需要像有 M A 这样的性质的出现。所以我衷心希望，未来说能在中国的下一步的发展当中，能扮演一个重要的角色。而这样一个协会，恰好是自上而下各方面都有关系。Well, thank you very much. We will, we will certainly take you up on that offer. Our Chinese strategy is strong, and we will be doing that here. So, I'm being told that we are already over our time. I want to thank Chairman Wong and Rob both for their time this morning. Thank you.